there have been so many times I've been fortunate enough to interview uh, Coach Taft, Grant Taft, the legend, the icon. Everyone knows. Everyone knows about Coach Taft. Uh, we've sat down in your house and we've talked about your artifacts, the Indian uh, collection and all your history, your family. And then, of course, we've talked X's and O's in football. It's great to have you in the studio. You were here with us about a year ago. Yes. The first interview we did, yes, things have was, changed a little bit. I was quite honored, oh, to tell you the truth, so really, we. because it was, a, it was a startup. It was a new, new time for you all, you know, and so I, I just really appreciated being on. Armstrong Sims here today uh, as well. Mike Singletary told me that when he was a freshman or sophomore, that when you went to a lot of speaking engagements, of course, you've been to hundreds of them. I mean, why wouldn't people want you to speak at, at various events? That sometimes you would ask him to go with you. Mm -hmm. He thinks that perhaps one of the things that you were trying to do was show him some uh, kind of how to speak in front of people and maybe sure. leadership. And, and, and he said that it, it, it's something he was able to use the rest of his life do you remember those times, and was that some of the reasons if you took a Mike Singletary or anybody with you just so they could kind of see the moment? Absolutely. No, that, uh, there wasn't any question about it, and, uh, and it took with Mike. Mike, <laughs> Mike is a great speaker, and, uh, and he, uh, I, I think that he did get some foundational ideas there. It's one thing to show somebody something and let them see it and experience it rather than tell them. It's a different experience, and so that's why I would take Mike with me because I knew he was going to be one of Baylor's great all-time players. I knew that early on. Uh, he was uh, just unbelievable as a player. So I knew that, and I, I knew that he would be interviewed and that his background, where he came from, uh, down in Houston, Texas, you know, uh, he probably didn't get a lot of that. So I wanted to prepare him. I never wanted him to in any way be embarrassed, you know, or not do a, a job that he felt proud about. And so uh, I, I knew what he was going to be. And so before he was that, I started training him on his speaking. He came from a broken family. Yes. He said you taught him a lot about a lot of things as far as uh, family, yeah. um, commitment, love, all that stuff as well, that that was one of the things that one time you had a speech and all of a sudden you couldn't make it. And he's not so sure if you really couldn't make it or you wanted to give him the opportunity. And all of a sudden it was, he was up and he was ready for it. But yeah. was that yeah. because you couldn't make it or because you felt like it was time for him to deliver? A, it some, was some, time. It was time. very good. Yeah. He needed, he needed to step out. Well, he remembers that uh, uh, quite a bit. He, he told me, he goes, he's like, he was, he was like, <laughs> you know those eyes he has when he's getting rid of a snap? I think that's probably what he looked like at that time. You have to as a coach, no matter what sport, you, you recruit players, and all of them come from different backgrounds. Come, some come from families that have been together forever, and some come from where they have no idea where sometimes their parents are. Broken families or really abusive or backgrounds that are so hard. Uh, what did it mean to you when you recruited players that really had nothing and then they became professionals and not just players, I'm talking about real mm -hmm. businessmen successful? Yes. Well, you know, frankly, it's really what, for me, it's all about. Uh, you have to win in my profession to do the things you want to do with young people. You have to keep your job. So it's a, it's a double layer. You know, you can go through life trying to help kids and let them grow and mature, but at the same time, to keep your job and do what you want to do, you got to win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. so it's, it was a unique combination, but uh, I, I, I've been so blessed to have so many young men that have turned out so well uh, in life as husbands and as fathers and as leaders in their communities and... Uh, um, just, uh, it's just wonderful to see them, uh, where they are in life right now. 1978, you guys were three and seven mm -hmm. Had lost five games by nine points. Mm -hmm. Andrew Mellentree told me that there was a time during that season. I'm not sure if it was after that or when it was that you had about three or four bad apples on that team. Yeah. And he spoke with you and the leadership and, and it was time for them to go. Yeah. And 
was it after a practice when you said it's time for these players to go and there was like a police mm-hmm. waiting at the stadium entrance for them to go? You remember <laughs> wasn't, that? Wasn't quite that bad. <laughs> but uh, I, I did send them on their way. And, How hard is that? Well, it's hard because, you, you know, you never want to give up on anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when you dismiss a player from your squad, uh, you have virtually given up on him. That you're saying, I can't do any more. And uh, or you're not allowing me to do any more. And so go out into the world. And I had a letter that uh, was uh, really interesting. I had a letter from one of the young men that, uh, that happened. And this was about two years ago. Hmm. So it's been a lot of time since then. But he was one that I dismissed. <clears throat> and the letter started out by saying, Coach Taff, I hated your guts for several years because of what happened. He said, then I realized what you were trying to teach me. And I've changed my life. I've, I've, uh, everything about me has changed. My whole attitude, my commitment to my family, my commitment to my Lord, uh, it's all changed. And it goes back to the time that you had to discipline me. And so, you know, those things are hard uh, when you do it. But but if the guy will think about it and understand what took place, it can really make a difference in their life. So I think that actually was in the spring after the three and seven season that you addressed them, and and then you guys went on to go to the Peach Bowl and have a successful year. Um, in 1978, you had won that 74 Southwest Conference. Everyone knows the story: the miracle on the brows, beating Texas, the, the worm, and all that stuff. And there were some. Maybe people who are getting a little disgruntled. Did you, did you did you spoil them a little bit with what you did in '74? Did you feel? Did you ever feel a pressure? <clears throat> well, yeah, you know, uh, Baylor hadn't won anything in in 50 years. I know. We, we've heard that before <laughs> yeah. with the basketball. So yeah. you know, so when we we won that, then everybody changed, and 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 I never will forget a leading administrator. Uh, whom I shall not name, uh, told me after uh, that, he said, now, Coach, uh, now remember, they hadn't won anything in 50 years. And so this administrator said, well, you know, Coach, uh, uh, if you can do that about every four years, that'll be fine. Oh, really? Yes. So from we went from not winning anything to being able to compete every year, but at least win one every four years championship. That was, that was nice of him to, to put that. <laughs> and you know, but you, you, 1980, and you were in the mix a few other times. Was there ever a game? Uh, there was a game, was it fourth down and Neil Jeffrey threw the ball out of bounds? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and there are other games you lose. Do you, do you remember the losses oh, more sure. than the wins? Uh, you know, I don't. Yeah, because I've heard that before, <laughs> yeah. and and it's I, like, how do you not remember the great wins? But then again, those are the ones that yeah. sting. Well, I think on the losses, I think they are embedded because if you handle a loss properly as a coach, then you will have made gain, even sometimes more than if you won the game. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And uh, and so. That, that's what I, I remember about, you know, the losing. How could we correct that? What caused it? And now how can we correct that? And can those that did the lack of responsibility in the first place, can they now find that responsibility that they need to take to win? So those players that you had to dismiss, that, dismiss you went on to the Peach Bowl. Do you feel like that made everybody else realize what – like, first of all, who the boss was is if they didn't know that already, but also the accountability factor. No question. Kind of everyone else just kind of became refreshed by that. No question about it. it, it uh, and it, it always is hard because you're dealing with a young life. And uh, so what you hope from that when you uh, or when I expelled uh, a person from our team, I, I told them and I hope them that you will learn from this and it'll make a difference in your life, and you will change uh, the things that need to be changed. And that's the outcome you hope that would happen. 
Alfred Anderson was a great player at Richfield. Everyone knows him. He was a great player with Baylor, and he was also a heck of an NFL player as well. When he committed to Baylor, he told me a story that Dave Campbell, <laughs> that Dave Campbell put out, I guess in the Waco trip, Alfred Anderson commits to Baylor. Yeah. Had he committed to you? Well, not really. <laughs> I knew he was going to. <laughs> well, he did after that, right? He had no other choice. That's right. Is that just a little bit of? Uh, well, you know, he uh, he teases me about that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Alfred does. But, uh, you know, I knew that Baylor was a place for him. He, you know, honestly, seriously, he's a wonderful young man, I'm telling you. And, uh, you know, he, his, uh, he was living at home with a single parent at the time. And, uh, you know, he just needed me. He needed Baylor. And so I just made sure I got him. <laughs> you got it. He said after you signed, you walked out the door and you shouted, Yahoo! Like really, really loud. And he said, I was shocked to hear him shout that loud. I turned around and Coach Taff had this beaming smile on his face. I made the right decision. He knew it was the right decision. I earned my degree, an opportunity to play football. And um, you. Well, that, here, here's the reason I yelled. And I did. That's a true story. Uh, when I got the commitment out of him, mm -hmm. you know, I walked out the door and one of my assistants was waiting for me in the core, car. And I couldn't wait to get to the car to tell him. And I just yelled. <laughs> Everybody in the neighborhood heard me, you know. But it was a it was an important day because uh, that man oh. can play football now, and uh, uh, there's never been a finer young man and now a finer man than Alfred Anderson. Wow, he'll love to hear that, and he well, he knows true. that. You've told yeah. him that. Walter Abercrombie, another local great player from University High, how uh, you had obviously wanted him to play at Baylor, but he wanted to take a few more trips, and there were maybe a couple of them that you weren't so sure he needed to take because of the way things were at that time yes. in the Southwest Conference without, yes. yeah. And do you remember, I'm not, we don't need to mention the school, but he was going to go take a trip to one of them. And you said, what did you, you remember what you said to him? No, I don't. <laughs> but something about Walter, are you a man of integrity? Yes. And yeah, that, that, yeah. How they remember that? Well, I mean, he he is, he is, he was then as a young person, and he uh, he uh, is of course now, and uh, what a wonderful man he turned out to be. But yeah, and and you know, young people like that, they get in a room with a bunch of coaches, and mm -hmm. somebody will bring in alumni. I never did, but a lot of schools brought in alumni, and you know, kind of insinuated all kinds of things, and. So after he had committed to me, uh, you know, I, I really talked to him about, you know, making that commitment and the integrity that it takes to be the kind of man he wants to be. And he's going to have to, you know, probably turn down some pretty uh, lucrative looking situations at these other schools to stick with his commitment. Like that's a briefcase? That's basically like he, 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 he said you told him what would happen and he went on this trip and it's sure. exactly what happened. Yeah, and he thought that at, at that moment, I think he was always going to go to Baylor. But that's when he realized what you knew, the insight you were trying to help him with. It, it played out exactly the way you said it would yes. when he went on this trip. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've seen him many times get off those airplanes with the black bag. Yes, many times. How sad was it when the Southwest Conference exploded? Well, for me, it was very sad because I grew up uh, loving the Southwest Conference as a kid out in West Texas. Of course, we had no television those years, and uh, so I would listen to a fellow named Kern Tips mm -hmm. uh, broadcast the Southwest Conference games uh, on our big radio in our living room, one of those great big old Is that the radios. Diamond Shamrock Network or something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah. And, uh and he was so good, and he could literally make you see it. That's one of the things that, that I, I, I perceived, uh, you know, with him, is that when I heard him talk, I could see things. Mm -hmm. 
So in my speaking, I developed a technique of creating word pictures so that the audience could have a better view of what I was talking about. And so that, and, and I, I kind of learned that from Kern Tips and then expanded on it, you know. He was very good. The best compliment I think a broadcaster can get is if somebody's listening to the game on the radio and they feel like they're actually at the game, and as you said, they can actually visualize yeah. exactly what's going on. From the colors of the uniforms to the crowd oh. to the setting to the scenery to the view. Oh. Well, I mean, I'm sitting there listening to a radio and, and I'm seeing it. I see the game because of the way current tips could describe it. And uh, so, yeah, and, and, and you know, I, I have some experience in broadcasting. You know, I, oh. I, I was involved in that because I really loved it and knew what, what it can do. And, and it's just like with you and, and your staff, you know, what you all do for people out there that can't go to a game they, they can be at the game by the way you describe it, you know, and the enthusiasm that you put into it. So I learned an awful lot from broadcasting. Lane is here. Um, you're doing these podcasts, and you're putting together like an archives, a library, yeah. Grant Taft, of, similar to maybe what we're doing here. But you're, you're putting all of the I, I can't even imagine <laughs> how many you could possibly do, hundreds <laughs> if not possible. Maybe <laughs> if you – but – is it, why are you doing that? Well, you know, one of the things that, that has always motivated me, uh, and particularly uh, in the years when I was speaking uh, three or four times a week all over the country, coaching and doing uh, my responsibilities, even when I was AD, and then when I went into the American Football Coaches Association Executive Director, I still did that. And... Uh, I know how uh, uh, important it is for young people out there uh, all across the country to be able to hear somebody that's been there and done that and can articulate uh, what uh, it's like and to give them some inspiration is that, hey, uh, I need to get my education. I need to have that opportunity to, to have those kind of experiences. So. To me, uh, my experiences were always uh, uh, shared to try to help uh, young people set their own goals. You always end up talking. I'm not sure if every coach has always invited you to come talk to the new staff or as the staff changes. I know earlier this year uh, when they made the coaching changes, you went and visited with the new staff, the ones who were new, plus the others, Joey McGuire, who had been there, Sean Bell, whatever, with Coach Aranda. And I was told – that you could hear a pin drop when you started talking. That, is that about as much respect as you can get? Yes, it is. Uh, attention, that means, means they're paying attention and listening to you. I got eyeballs on me, and I've got eyeballs on them. And so the best way to communicate is when you have complete attention. What is the true story about the worm? Well, you, you, you have time for that? Well, I, you know, everyone's heard about it, and then I think things grow. Yeah, yeah. And then sometimes people get the years mixed up. Oh, yeah. Well, before the game, at halftime of the game, Texas, 1974, did you try to clean the worm off, put it in a little file or something like that, and it got dirty again? And then, well, what's the story about that? And why that game and why that moment? Well, Texas was picked, sure. uh, of course, to beat us. Uh, we were just kind of getting everything together here at Baylor University, and Texas was the, the, the big dog, uh, you know. Sure. So my goal was to beat big dogs, you know. And uh, so one of the things that I, that I found uh, with our players was that they were very attentive to what I had to say and what I did. And uh, that's a real blessing for a coach mm -hmm. to have that. You, so they're you, not hanging their head or looking up in the air. Yeah, yeah you, don't, you, don't, you don't just get that. I mean, it, it, for somehow it comes to you. But I, I knew they hung on every word that I said. And so I wanted to try to find some way 
uh, to impress them. And uh, so <laughs> I came up with this cockamamie idea because uh, uh, I had uh, heard this story and I related it to them. And it's to simplify it for your listeners, uh, it had to do with fishing and how you could be more successful fishing. And that is if you uh, had the worms and you, uh, you know, put the worms in your mouth before you put them on the hook. And that would catch the fish. And... And so I was thinking about what I could do before the Texas game because they were heavily favored over us. And so I told them the story. Told them the story is what I did. And uh, earlier in the week, uh, after practice, mm -hmm. I told them the story. And they, they kind of took it like, mm -hmm, you know, that kind of big old, it, wasn't, it didn't go over real big. <laughs> so, so then before the game, I had... This idea, I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And so I get in the car, and I go over on Valley Mills, and I go to one of those little... <laughs> bait shops. Bait shops. or No, it wasn't even a bait shop. It's just one of those 7-Eleven, but mm -hmm. they had worms in there. So I go in, and the guy said, Coach, I thought you had a game. I said, yeah, I do. I, I got something to do. <clears throat> uh, what is it, Coach? Can I help you with it? Yeah, I said, you got any fishing worms? Fishing worms? I said, well, Coach, you got a game. I said, no, no, just please, do you have fishing worms? Yeah, I got him over here. Okay, give me a box. <clears throat> a little box of them. So I paid him, went back to the office, and go, go in my office, and it's getting close to time to go to meet with the team. And so I go in my little bathroom back there, and I take a bleach down and pull out this one big old long one. And so I put him under the hydrant, and I washed that sucker. <laughs> really good. I mean, I gave him a bath, man. So <clears throat> then I put him in my hand and then stuck him in my pocket. So then when I go in to meet the team, because I had already told them the story mm -hmm. out on the field earlier in the week that you got to do what it takes to get the job done. Well, if you're going to catch the fish, you got to be willing to keep the worms warm on a cold day. So I reiterated the story, and I said, guys, while you're beating Texas today, I'm going to be keeping the worms warm. And I opened my mouth, and he was above me, and I dropped him in my mouth right there. And those guys went nuts. They were banging on the walls. They were kicking their, you know, their yeah. benches. So anyway, we go out, start out field, and I reach in, drop him in. <laughs> Drop him in the trash, you know, on the way out. Good fella. He was. He did a good job for me. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. He, he had that look, you know. And so, anyway, we go out and win the game. And I I probably, to be honest with you, that had nothing to do with beating Texas. In fact, I had two or three of the guys said, Coach, that made me sick in my stomach. I think Coach Fredenberg told me he may have heard you in the bathroom trying to spit some of the dirt out of your mouth or whatever or whatever it was at the time. <laughs> Speaking of that, uh, I believe you played LSU. Was that a Liberty Bowl? I think it was LSU. You won the game 27-7, to whatever the score was. But the week of the game, you're in a hotel, and the fire alarm goes off. And Coach Fredenberg, all, every, all coaches, of course, you have your certain – philosophical type of things like don't make irrational decisions without having all the facts so an alarm goes off in the hotel and of course down in the lobby there's people everywhere and coach Fredenberg's like feeling his door to make sure there's no fiery fire high all the it's commotion and chaos and you walk up to him I believe and said who did it and I he said John Simpson so you thought about it and I think you were probably going to help John Simpson get on the next flight out of town. But he always said, make sure you have all the facts before you make any kind of decision. And then it was found out that your All-American or All-Southwest Conference linebacker, Barry, was a part of this, yeah, too. Ray Barry. Yeah. So, that it <laughs> <laughs> so you had the facts. Facts. And the facts help you make decisions. Yes. And so I made the right decision.
And they stayed. They stayed. <laughs> <laughs> and both of them were on each side of the ball, the players of the game. Yes. They were playing for their life. They, <laughs> not for the, not for no, the no, team. No, no, they had nothing to do with the game. <laughs> they were petrified. <laughs> they were, because they knew. I just said, okay, I'll deal with this after the game. Oh, so that's like when they had that over their head. There's nothing worse than when my mom, we have five children and, and four boys, and my mom, the worst thing she could ever say to me was, you wait until your father gets home. Yeah. Is there anything worse than other, or if your mother says your full name, David Allen Smoke, or they bring in the middle name, then, then it's not good at all. But it's wait till your father gets home. <laughs> and that's kind of what almost you said to them. We'll deal with this later. Absolutely. That's right. They played like crazy, man. They were <laughs> outstanding. <laughs> Was there ever a recruit, Billy Sims, Earl Campbell? I know you were in the mix for all of these guys. Yeah. Which one was the one that even to this day that you feel like? Well, i tell you, um, Earl Campbell probably because uh, I had Earl's mom. And uh, that's usually a good start. Mm -hmm. I went for the moms. And if I got the mom, I usually got the player. And But I got Miss Campbell. She used to come by and see me on her way to watch Earl play Texas. <laughs> she, she'd drive through her. <clears throat> wonderful lady and raise a wonderful young man in that Earl Campbell. But Earl and I have remained friends all these years. And... Uh, uh, turn. He's a wonderful man, as well as everybody knows what kind of player he was. Yeah. But I would love to have had him on my team. 1991 team got as high as I think number eight in the country, and then you lost to Rice. It was a tough day. Yeah. What happened to that team? On That's that, day? that kind of a season that got away. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's like it's like anything else. You have got to be on your toes at every game. And the problem was, you know, as coaches, we, you know, we know that. And we tried to tell, tell our players that, that you're going into a trap, you know, because Rice doesn't have anybody in the stands, mm -hmm. you know, and you're, you're going into a trap. And don't let them lull you uh, into being in a position to lose the game. That's what happens. You know, you you just get into the game and then you don't do the things you normally do. And all of a sudden, you know, it's seven to seven and you're going into the late end of the third quarter. And you just, uh, you, you can see it coming as a coach. Is it more emotional, mental than it is physical? Because physically, you're still the same people you were. Yeah, today. yeah, yeah. I, I think it's all, it's yeah. all approach. Number one, they weren't very good, you know at the time, but they had a good coach and uh, they had some good players and they just hadn't played very well. But on this one day, they played lights out, played mm -hmm. the best they could play. And so you have to figure that when you're playing a team that's uh, not as good as you are. You have to figure that there's going to be that day when they rise to the occasion. I had many teams do that. Mm -hmm. Many teams that were uh, uh, sub to other teams in the conference and we'd rise up and beat them, you know. And so I, I, I know all about that mentality. And uh, so, you know, we we kind of walked into a trap. Yeah, and it kind of just started a little bit of a slide. Plus, you started playing good people, too. I mean, you were pretty yeah. good. Uh, how many times can you, in, in baseball terms, if the team's in a slump, the manager comes in and clears off the buffet and has one of those talks with the players or whatever, they close the clubhouse. How many times can you do that? before players stop listening in football you have 11 maybe 12 or now even 14 games 11 or 12 in the regular season can can you one it has to count that's got to count one other other than that it's the it, players start kind of looking at each other okay here we go so you know it, it, that's that's the the toughness of of, of coaching particularly on a collegiate level where they're more mature than they were in high school, but they're still not totally grown men. You know, they, they may be physically grown, 
but they still are not totally mature, you know, as college students. So, you know, you just, uh, you have to be very, very cautious about how you deal with them. And, and uh, I, 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 I relied so much, uh, Smoke, on my players, my leadership. I, I really worked hard at developing leadership that was there among the players that could be transmitting my concepts of how we're going to win. Scott Drew had a bunch of experienced fifth-year senior Mark Vidal, Macy Otega. Yeah. He had a lot of – and I think that's what allowed him. Sometimes like Jerome Tang or Scott Drew would say or whoever, Coach Jake, they didn't have to always be the ones that were saying things. They had a guys that – internally their leadership was so strong and experienced that it got through the pause, yes. the post-pause slump, and then – without ever getting too high or too low, although it got to a point they were a little bit edgy. Yeah. What did that mean? It, honestly, the 74 Southwest Conference beating Texas on your way to the Southwest Conference title. What did that mean to Baylor this past week? Oh, the basketball this yes, year? Yes, sir. Oh, that, uh, it, in many ways, it's uh, similar to the 74 because the 74 changed everything. It changed the giving. It changed mm -hmm. the mentality of the media. It changed the mentality uh, and the outlook of the high school coaches and the players that we were trying to recruit. It changed the concept of the giving. Uh, the giving to the university just exploded. You know, I mean, talking about buildings that are built around mm -hmm. here, a lot of it came out of uh, people that had good feelings about uh, being able to compete uh, on the athletic field for, for Baylor University. And same way with this year, uh, with Scott taking it all the way and winning the national championship. That just says so much for a great university that is academically oriented to be able to step on an athletic field, have your academics, have your success there, but still be able to line up and... Uh, win a national championship or a conference championship. They destroyed Gonzaga. That, they were a buzzsaw in that tournament. They, I thought it all started with what they did to Villanova in the second half. They were down at halftime. They weren't quite yet set. And then all of a sudden, they made a great team or a team that's got a lot of tradition look very average or bad. And it just seemed like from that point on, it was a landslide for them. that they were. Well, and, and I have to... I believe this with all my heart, uh, that goes back uh, to coaching. Uh, certainly you have to have the athletes to do it, and they that's coaching. They recruited those athletes, the staff did, and then they have developed them and trained them. And then there is a mentality that a head coach can bring in to a, an environment, whether it's on a football field uh, or whether it's a, at a – tournament or individual game mm -hmm. or a track meet. Uh, we see this through the years with Clyde Hart. You know, he brings that – he recruits the great uh, athletes, but he brings that knowledge and mentality, that toughness that it takes to win championships. And the same thing that we see with uh, Coach Mulkey. Mm -hmm. Coach Mulkey, and I've told her this, I, and she loves it. I, I've told her many times, I said, Kim, you can coach my sport. She told me one time we were watching uh, somebody that was coaching here after I was the AD, I think. And, uh, and she and I were standing out there, and I said, Kim, you can coach my sport. You think so? And I said, I'll do. She said, well, where would you put me on your staff? And I said, linebackers. <laughs> <laughs> Aggressive. I tried it. Darn right. But <laughs> Coach Aranda's going through his first spring drills. It, it, for, I, I, I found this out. There were 450 days from the day he was hired until he had a chance to physically be in front of some of the parents, not this past weekend, but two weekends ago. And there were like just a handful of them. Then more last weekend. And then, of course, the spring game. He made changes. He made them emphatically. He saw where there was a problem. He seems to be blossoming a little bit, where it's now the first year maybe he was a coordinator as a head coach. And kind of he seems like, and he, of course they need to win, but do you see a difference? 
just from what you've noticed these last three to four months? Yes, I have. And uh, it's all good. Everything I've seen is good. Uh, he's a, Coach Aranda is a, a wonderful man, I'm telling you, in every aspect of manhood. And, uh, but the good, thing, good news is for Baylor, uh, he's an excellent football coach. And uh, the head coach has to make very important key decisions that a lot of times uh, you and the media don't even know about. And uh, he is so capable of that. He's so good at that. And the staff he's put together, <coughs> excuse me, I find to be a very, very solid uh, coaching staff. How, much, how important is it they have a spring game? It's not a game. It's a spring game. It doesn't count as a win or a loss, but do you think it's important <clears throat> for them to look like a football team this weekend, or does that matter? Well, the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, in the long run, uh, it, it probably doesn't matter that much, but in the short run, it's real important, not only for the players to execute well and for the coaches to feel that they got execution out of their players, and then for those that are watching to feel that this is a team. Mm -hmm. This is a team that has great potential. How high can they go? How far can they go? But, but to have a, a team that not only looks good, but that conducts themselves the way a team at Baylor University could conduct themselves, and, and to be uh, in a position, to get themselves in a position to be able to win big. Coach, when you're sitting in your suite at the stadium at McLean Stadium and you look across and let's say that it's a large crowd and it's a big game and whether they're winning or not and you see the Brazos and you see all the facilities up and down and you, it's just unbelievable, the view. What do you see? Well, uh, honestly, uh, I, I'm just so blessed by it because it uh, is something that Baylor – uh, has always needed, and I'm so thankful that the Baylor leadership, not only the campus leadership, the president, and others on ADs through the years, uh, but the alumni that have supported all of this. Uh, I drove by the stadium the other day and looked at that amazing place. It's a beautiful, beautiful place, and uh, what a great thrill it would be to coach a game in there, but... Uh, uh, Baylor is in a, a, I think, a catbird seat right now. I think they're in good position. And they're looking at maybe building this little basketball thing, huh? Yeah. It might be for everyone who goes up and down 35 to see that too. Oh, man. Did you ever dream that? <laughs> no. Because no. you're talking about no. the money started coming well. in in 74. And you, we all know the story about the turf. We've said that oh. many times where the, underneath the, the elevator was the – or the, the gym or on that gym, your weight room. But yeah. did you ever, ever dream Baylor would have all of this sprawling all over the place? No. No, no I mean, I'd like to say I did, but I didn't. You know, I, I'm, I, when I was here, it was an everyday battle, you know, for Just the next day. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> What's your favorite book? If you had a book that you wrote and you've written a bunch of them and you're mm. always writing something, is there one in particular that you said, this is the one you have to read? You know, I think uh, the one I would recommend to people was my very first book. It's called I Believe. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's really the story of uh, coming here, uh, finding the university in the position it was in, and then putting together a plan that could turn the football program around because I knew if I could turn the football program around – everything else would begin to fall into place. Giving, and then b new buildings could be built, all of those things. But Baylor was at a position where they had no respect from anybody, honestly. Probably the academic world, yeah. Right. A lot of respect there. But from their athletic program, there was no respect. And the people out there that had the money uh, just weren't giving because to what end? Why, why are we given to this bottomless pit, you know, that's not achieving anything? So when we came in, and, and I, I accepted this job, it was really interesting. 
I had no intentions of coming to Baylor. I was going back to Tech as the head coach under J.T. King. It was all set up. And I had come down here, and I told Lonell, I said, this place needs me, and I can do something with this place. What did she say? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> really? And I said, really? She said, all right, then let's get to get it done, get to moving. So that's basically the reason I came here is, is to – try to change to make a difference for this great university, that they could be respected uh, someplace other than the academics, which is the most important thing. But uh, uh, we, we chose to come, and, and I'm very grateful that, that through a lot of great players and support people and, and assistant coaches, uh, we were able to, to turn it around. And the big thing about things in the athletic world in college is imagery. Mm -hmm. What is your image? You know, what, what do people see? And so that's the thing that's the hardest to turn around. When Baylor had been the doormat, to turn that around and, and have those good athletes look at us as just as good as Texas, that was, that's the hard part. But. Back with more, Grant Taff on Sikkim 365 Radio. We're back with the great Grant Tapp on Sikkim 365 Radio, and we appreciate the time we get from you anytime. The, uh, you, were, you, were, you were talking about when you took this job and what Don L said, and you, you, it, the belie I believe the book and all of the things you started to try to get accomplished. Did you ever have a day early on where you thought it was impossible? No. No. Um. I, I, I'm, I'm, and this sounds a little bit like uh, I'm overconfident, but uh, I just never uh, ran into anything that I couldn't fix uh, in the world of football. Uh, I took over Angelo State. I coached at Little McMurray University. I coached track successfully. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I knew about track when I became the head track coach at McMurray was turn left and hurry back as fast as you can. Yes, get here quick. <laughs> no, but no, yeah. but but I, I soon adapted to that, and the way I did it was the quality of athletes I recruited, and and what I learned early on and determined, you know, you you can recruit athletes that have great potential, but you also have to have in that athlete you have to have the determination to get the education and the ability to get an education. Yeah, and you I just want it, but need it and, and have the ability to yeah, gather. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, there's some that just can't do it on a, on a college level. So you have to really discern, discern that. So you, you, what I did then is selected guys that had great upside athletically that within two years they'd be as good as any blue chip that had been recruited by anybody. And, and that takes some skills because what I had been able to do as a young coach was to coach track. And I learned very quickly about athleticism, about the ability to create speed, and the ability, you know, to be able to uh, throw a shot, uh, have the coordination for throwing a discus, all of those things. So it really helped me determine how I was going to select athletes that would develop. At McMurray, I couldn't get the blue chip player. Mm -hmm. So I had to take young guys that had an upside. And the other thing about that is that if you do that, you got to have them there for year four and five. Right. Okay, how do you have them there for year four and five? They've got to be academically available, available in their own abilities to make it to year four and five on the collegiate level. You can't bring in people that are going to be there through year one and they're gone. Yeah. You got, you it accomplish up the nothing. roster. You can't accomplish yeah. nothing. Yeah. 
I don't know if I've ever asked you this. I've never read this before. Maybe I have. Is there one player that was the, the one that started? Was there the, the, the first player that committed? Maybe he wasn't a big blue chip, but was there a name? Everyone knows about the great names in, in Baylor history, but was there a name that you got a commitment from that may have started it, that got everyone's attention? Oh, it's hard to say, you know, because each year was different in recruiting. You know, it's a whole different cast of characters out sure. there that, that you're dealing with. And, and I, I think what I relied on more than anything else was the trust I had built with coaches. As a young coach, I had clinics for coaches. I, college coach, when I was at McMurray, uh, I put on clinics uh, for, for high school coaches. So my whole coaching career, I had involved myself, even though I was on the collegiate level, with high school coaches. And uh, so they would tell me the truth. Uh, and that was so important, you know, because as I went through my coaching career, the trust I'd built up with high school coaches paid huge dividends for me. You can go back and look at the people that we recruited, and they weren't the big blue mm -hmm. chippers. Texas and A&M got those guys. But yet then later, we're beating Texas and A&M with the guys we recruited. They had the big upside. Baylor's had to do that a lot. They've had some dudes now they've, over the years. I yeah. mean, they've had some, wow, they got him. But that, that's pretty much almost the mentality of Baylor, even with what Coach Drew did. Sure. Or what, what Kim's, Kim's been able to get. She gets elite because women's yeah, basketball, the, yeah. the, 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 the well, tree um, doesn't go as tall as far as the number of talent, and she's got what she's got. But, yeah, I mean, isn't that what – and does that then mean it's not built by a paper sack? It's built the right way methodically if you do that because – Sure. Absolutely, Smoke. You know, uh, you, you just watch any great program, i.e. take Kim's program – here at Baylor, and you watch how and who, how and who she recruits, and then how those become elite college players, elite college players. And not all of them were so-called elite coming out of high school, but she knows how to select those that have not only a good upside, but that have the character and the academics to see to it that they're here for year four and five. That leads to a question. Robin Jones, who was at the pro, uh, practice on Saturday, he brought up a comment that back at 1974, he almost, he missed a block, blew an assignment, and a, a punt almost got blocked. He came to the sideline and you showed him. You didn't yell at him. You showed him what he did wrong. And like, then later in the game, there was another punt and he was, I don't know if he was the up back or whatever, and he perfectly blocked two guys. I think it may have been Iowa State. I can't remember if he told me the game. But when he came to the sideline, you said to him, that was perfect, exactly the way to do it. You're going to be a great player. He's always remembered that. That's 47 years ago, right? And <laughs> what does it mean to a coach? That case, one case, hundreds of cases when a player does listen and mm. then he does make a play because he did and you see him smile yeah it's coaching that's what coaching is about is that uh, you are able to convey to that individual player some information that will help him do his job be better and to his job better and that he will be better uh, as a player from the information you con conveyed to him that is coaching you know and uh, so those are wonderful moments uh, in a coach, uh, though many times we as coaches don't express it initially because you got games going on. And, but, boy, that's a great thrill to see, see a youngster get it. I like, to, I like to say they got it. You know, they understood. When you decided and you moved on from being the head coach, how much did that hurt you? The what now? When you, when you stopped coaching. Oh, yeah. Well, it... Uh, Didn't you yeah. deserve better? Well, you know, the, the point was, to me, uh, pretty simple, is that uh, there was a point 
in everybody's career where you've got to make a decision. And uh, I've seen coaches hang on way too long. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had other things that I felt like I was capable of doing. So it worked out really fine for me in the sense that uh, I ended up taking over the American Football Coaches Association. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and that was a, a joyous ride to be able to take that organization from uh, zero to 60 miles an hour in three seconds or something, you know. Did you have more impact then in football or as an administrator, as an executive director on the game? That's a good question because, uh, you know, in, in football, I, I definitely was a, a leader as a, as a coach. Um, I headed up the rules committee for several years, uh, making the rules that we play by. And, uh, and then I was on uh, the NCA, all the NCA committees, which were important. Uh, I took the time and the effort to do all that. Uh, then when I took over the American Football Coaches Association, that put me on a different level uh, with decision-making from an individual uh, to someone that is in the middle of it and that has an influence and an impact, and you can get decisions made uh, that are significant nationwide. College football is a monster. It's a billion-dollar business or whatever it might be. When was the last time you <clears throat> lost your temper? I don't lose my temper. Period. That's hard not to do. It's hard. Not That's to because do. you're. Is that because you're so at peace with everything? Eh, I think it's control. You know, self control. Uh, I, I, I maybe I need to clarify that. I might lose my temper, but I don't show it. Okay, inside, internally, it's like sometimes it's you hear about, like Coach Aranda or Tony Dungy or Lovey Smith, you hear about, they're not fiery enough, and they, they win. I heard that about Coach Aranda. They're 2-7, and seven, so he doesn't have that passion. That doesn't always mean you don't have the passion. It just means you have a different personality, right? That's or right, how, and a different way of expressing it. fire might still be burning. Yeah, expressing it, yeah. Yeah, I had, I had people on my staff that I put on my staff that that was their job. Mm-hmm. Corky Nelson is a good example. He's a fiery guy, and uh, he's always one I had to kind of keep <laughs> keep a little bit of a thumb on. But he was a great football coach, and uh, but he would get right with them, you know. And the other thing that I tried to do as the head coach is that I wanted to make when I said something, I wanted it to be significant. You know what I'm saying? Where, where if I just got in there and rattled off every day the same old, same old, same old, same old, then it got just in their head. It just, you know, that's what the coach is going to say. So I tried to make everything that I remarked about or that I uh, made a decision on uh, something that would be pretty significant. It counted. It day. made a difference. It got the attention. Yep. Yeah. Grant Taft, uh, longtime Baylor football coach, AFCA executive director, and of course uh, a legend in, in many ways. When you think of Grant Taft, if you could describe Grant Taft, how would you describe yourself? I know that's for others to decide and yeah, to say, well, but, it, but we all have an opinion of ourselves, sure. and we all uh, know where we try to go with ourselves. You know, uh, frankly, uh, my first uh, commitment is to my Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. I'm, I'm a Christian. I have been since I was 12 years old. And that is my first commitment uh, is uh, to Jesus, not just to my church. I'm First Baptist Church here in Waco, Texas, and a long, long, long time member. But that is a commitment I made when I was 12 years old. It affected me all throughout my coaching career. It's been a key integral part of my marriage. It's significant in raising my children because through that, I developed a philosophy 
that I believe uh, work pretty well uh, in all of those areas. Uh, in my marriage and raising my children, I got one of them with me today. She could, uh, Lane Pittman, Taff, uh, she could co comment on that. But, uh, the, you know, the, the thing that I, I believe uh, with all my heart is that we're placed uh, on this earth. We are given certain skills and talents and abilities. And it is up to us to utilize those and to utilize the wisdom that God gives us through our own individual brains. And, and that wisdom has to come in the way you deal with people. It was a huge thing in my coaching career. Is, uh, it was just almost innate that somehow I knew how to deal with players. And that was a big thing in my coaching, is individual players, how to, how to deal with them and the issues that they had. And sometimes you gotta be, you gotta deal pretty severely. And um, I, I can do that too. I wanna wrap it up with this and thanks for your time. As a, well, someone who sent me a note, he knew I was gonna have a chance to visit with you is that people, you know, do you like being idolized? Is that, is, is you know, it, I've, that's- I've never even thought about that, I don't. He said that I absolutely worship and idolize Coach Taff. Wow. Well, I, you know, I, I, that's just kind of foreign to me. I, I like for people to respect me. Mm -hmm. I like for my former players uh, to like me and care about me. And the word love is okay. Uh, I used it. Uh, I used it sort of as a bludgeon, uh, you know, uh, with my players. You know, when I, when I first started telling my players I love them, they were like, oh, oh yeah, you know. But then they realize you, through your actions, you know, you determine uh, if you really love somebody. It's with your own family and with your wife. You know, you can say the word, I love you, but what are your actions? How do you express your daily involvement with either your athletes or your family or your business or whatever it might be? And... That is the telltale story. And the story with Coach Taft. Man, thanks a lot, buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lane. Appreciate you. Armstrong Sims. I'm David Smoke with Grant Taft. We could talk forever. Sikkim 365 Radio.